Hello and welcome to a new episode of Technique. My name is Sam Fry and today Richard F. Adams is interviewing a very special guest. One that I will reveal after a little bit of music. So today's guest is Professor Rachel Cooper, who is a specialist in design research, both in her role as Director of Imagination Lancaster and as a Distinguished Professor of Design Management and Policy at Lancaster University. But I'll let Richard introduce her a little bit more. It's a very, very special person here today, someone who has influenced policy at government level and works with some of the highest achieving research teams in the country. We've got Professor Rachel Cooper, who is Distinguished Professor of Design Management and Policy at Lancaster University. In this episode, Richard and Rachel talk about a variety of different topics. They start by talking a little bit about how you design sustainable cities and some of the research that Rachel Cooper and her teams have been doing in that area. Then they talk about the role of design in society in general and why we need to change education to respond to some of the changes in society. It's a fantastic discussion and one that has happened quite recently, so there are some references to Facebook scandals and Cambridge Analytica. But hey, what technology podcast isn't referencing those things right now? Anyway, you probably don't want to hear me speak too much. So let me hand you over to Richard and Rachel talking about design. So I formed uh, over 12 years ago now something called Imagination Lancaster. And that is an open and exploratory design-led research lab where we do applied and theoretical research into people, products, places and their interactions. So we cover everything from ageing to health and well-being to cities to the role and value of design and innovation. We started with seven people. I think there are about 40 people now. Wow. And we get do funded research and we work with communities too. Two projects I've recently been working on is one was a very large project called Livable Cities and that was working with about five other universities. So, so my interest is how design and creative thinking works with other disciplines to solve global and national and international challenges. So Livable Cities was basically the design group at Lancaster working with civil engineers in Birmingham, transport engineers in at UCL, energy specialists in, in Southampton. So we were looking at how you live in cities and the design work that we were looking at in Lancaster was on well-being and health and how you design cities around well-being so and is, health. So is the overall thing about everything from infrastructure through to, yeah. through to psychological really, effects of things on yeah, people? Yeah, so it started with the lead researcher, Professor Chris Rogers in Birmingham, saying he wanted to get a, a, a really large interdisciplinary group together to look at how we live in cities and how we look at the design of the infrastructure both underground and overground and uh, the transport and the ecological systems so he thought we should look at everything in a sustainable way so it's the social aspects of a city the energy and um, uh, environmental aspects of a city and economic aspects of a city and we worked for five years there was over a hundred of, a, hundred of us working on de wow. various aspects of data aspects of a city. And interestingly enough, at the end of the project, which finished in December, we produced 37 videos. <laughs> we produced one rather large but very short overarching video. And we produced a whole series of little books. They're all on a website called livablecities.org.uk. You can download all these little books. And they came really from our design perspective because, you know, I think that, you know, academics can spend their whole life writing journal papers to get them credits in their, their mm -hmm. career. But, you know, as a designer, I'm interested in get, giving people things that they can get access to these complex topics. We've got little books of well-being, little books of smart cities, little books of a sharing city, little books of mobilities in a city. The person we had on the project working with me was I had a, a graphic design PhD student who looked at the way we use graphic design 
to communicate these complex issues. Her whole PhD was on visualising the complexity of a city and how you do that and how you can communicate that to people. So it just shows you that you can be, at the one end, looking at, you know, how citizens use energy and how we can reduce energy. And the other end, we can be using design to communicate some of the complexity and some of the findings. Was, was there anything there that in that PhD project in particular that has either been put in use or, or led yeah, to so being she, used somewhere? She's writing papers now about how you use how you use design to illustrate conversations about complexity. So the little book of sharing in the city yeah is there something you can download and it illustrates not only how we looked at sharing in a city and how we engage with the community but how Serena Pilastri who wrote who who did the PhD visualized how people shared in the city That Living Livable Cities project resulted in a lot of different perspectives. It also resulted in a, a different way of conceptualising a city away from the sustainable three pillars of social, economic, environment. We still think of the urban environment in the way we did when it expanded in the Industrial yeah. Revolution. Yeah. And it's, it's built as a means of storing and deploying economic capital yeah. in different ways. But obviously, as society's grown, we've got more freedoms, we've got more other things that we are doing that are not related directly to economic capital. So I don't know if... Is there any, if, any way you could explain that all a little bit further? Well, <laughs> well <laughs> That's, probably. Sorry. Um, yes, well, of course, there are um, obviously different tensions now. It, the, cities are the source of economic growth, and growth is, is still the paradigm of the moment, but a lot of people are looking at other ways. The whole ecosystem services, how we share the spaces with birds, bees, you know, mm. rats and whatever, that, that makes it work. The way in which we can share things differently, but not in an economic sense. So at the end of the project, we said, actually, in order to really think about the future of a place, you first of all need to understand the values of that place and what that place wants to be, and then use that to drive your agenda. So we worked with somebody called Professor Nick Tyler at UCL, and he was talking about, well, what if you wanted your city to be a courteous city? How would that change the way you you looked at traffic and, and passengers and oh, the services? Yeah. So actually starting to look at what are the principles that you want to set, you know, the future of your place? And then how do you translate that into design tools, planning tools that will achieve that? Do you see what I mean? No, I so, understand perfectly. I mean, it's really interesting that you design something for courtesy. And, and we do try yeah. and do that yeah. in public spaces sometimes, yeah. but it's never applied to the road. All it is is on the road. Well, it, a it, set it, of rules, and that's that. It is. Yeah. It is apply. There is some people trying to apply it through the use of something called shared space, mm. and that has both bad press and good press. So shared space is when you you take away all the road markings, all the signage, all the red lights, and basically the the pavement and the road only change by the nature of the the fabric. So the different sort of brickwork, and you can cross anywhere. Ah, this traffic. happened outside the V&A, didn't it? They've, That's they've right. Yeah. Lots of people complained about that. Yeah. And that was because it was too wide. The place where I live actually is the only other place in the country, or one of the few places in the country has adopted it as a small place. And it does change the nature. People slow down. They wave to each other. They're polite. They watch out, you know. And it makes you have take responsibility back. Are we going you back know. to the scenes that you, you, you see in the old uh, paintings yes, where, you've, where exactly. you've got horses on the street and people are yeah. talking to each other and yeah. mingling? Yes. There's a whole thing about, well, this is where we come to design for behaviour change. Hmm. So if you put lots of rules in, people actually take less responsibility. You know, they wait for the traffic lights to go and they, and they look at the rules. But if you take the rules away, everybody has to be a little bit more careful. I've 
travelled a lot, as you know, and I think I've noticed when you go to certain countries, people do not cross the road unless they are told to. Exactly. And they find it quite freaky sometimes when they come to a place like London or Manchester where they're just people are just blithely wandering across in the gaps. <laughs> But I, I think British people in that sense are actually quite well behaved and do follow the rules. I think we don't, we're certainly not as anarchic as the roads in India that you exactly. go on where you really are taking your life in your hands sometimes. Yeah. But how do you so stop that? Hmm. In the place where I live, Poynton in Cheshire, they changed the whole of the village centre to be shared space. They got rid of the traffic lights. They put in two mini round or roundabouts and it, it's still, there are still two halves. There are half of the place that think it's dreadful and there are the other <laughs> half that think it's brilliant. Um, but it did actually change the culture and the nature of the space. More people, there's more coffee shops sort of on the street and the traffic flows. So I think you have to, in the end, that's why I'm very interested in the relationship between design, you could say art <coughs> and creativity, and human behaviour how it affects our psyche, whether, you know, you're designing to, to change the way people drive or, or use a place or, or whether you're trying to design out crime by putting psychological features in place. I think there's a really interesting relationship between the way we design things and human behaviour and mental, and inevitably mental well-being. I, th I think that's another thing, isn't it, because cities are cities. stressful and... Uh... Exactly. You know, you've got everything, physical symptoms of that with the increase in mental illness yeah, and yeah. physical things like yeah. diabetes and stuff, which all seem to be symptoms of yeah. us not quite um, getting the diet right, if you like. Right. So, yeah, yeah. So, so we now switch into the other area that I'm interested in, which is the sort of relationship between the digital and the physical space. You know, we're not only living in a physical space, which causes stress, it's there's pollution, not exercising enough, not enough access to green space, therefore affecting our health and well-being from a physical perspective. But then you have the digital perspective where, you know, everybody's engaged in social media, the Internet of Things, everybody's linked to the, the digital public space. And interestingly enough, there's a lot more people concerned about, well, what is this doing, the digital space doing to our mental health, as well as the physical space. Mm. So they are connected. In some respects, a lot of what designers have traditionally done it is becoming rather old-fashioned now, the idea of making images and this, that and the other. And actually the value in design is becoming about how people interface with things much, much more. The essence of design, I've just written a paper, or I'm writing a paper on the value of design and innovation. I looked at all the papers that have been written on design and innovation since the year dot. And the common factor in design and probably well, in creativity and design, is that people actually translate the intangible into the tangible. Mm. And the whole ability to visualise and conceptualise the future through that is the uniqueness that, that designers, creatives have, is that they are able to uh, imagine the physical world and also now take people into the digital world, into the, into the digital space. So that's, the core, I think, one of the core skills. But then... Beyond that, in order to do that, designers need to think very carefully about this complexity again, about mm. all, all the uh, intervening factors, you know, the behaviour, the material world, the, 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 the technology, you know, designers need to, uh, need to embrace all of that. They always have been. If we go back to Wedgwood, he was making pots, he was thinking about selling them pots, he was looking at the material those pots were being made. <laughs> the trouble is... The designer's horizon and the materials and the technologies and the production and the people they're producing for is much greater and more complex. Well, the context of Wedgwood was that there was a limited context. Yeah. Yeah, so you literally had a, a limited number of ways you could do things yeah. and the ways you could get things out. But now, if you move into the digital area, there's increasingly yeah. no barrier to anything. Interesting, and, and this is where you get onto what designers have used for a long time called uh, user-centered or human-centered design. 
And at, at Lancaster, one of my colleagues, Paul Colton, and I are looking at getting away from user-centered design when you look at the Internet of Things. Mm. When you look at the Internet of Things, things are talking to things without the human in the middle. The human comes in somewhere, but the human is just another thing in that ecosystem or that constellation of things. So the complexity for the designer now is what's the relationship between that item that's collecting data and sending it to that item that's collecting data? Where are the trust issues? Where are the security issues? And that brings me to the other project that I'm working on, which is called Privacy, Ethics, Trust, Risk, Adoption and Security of the Internet of Things. Wow. You can't do it all, but the bit that we're looking at at Lancaster is adoption and accessibility. So, yeah. and we're basically looking at domestic things. So at the moment, you know, we do, we haven't got a fridge, we haven't got an Internet of Things fridge, but we do have an Internet of Things kettle. <laughs> and, you know, and when we plugged it in, it sent data to a remote server in Iceland. Wow. So what's happening there? You know, how many of us, I mean, I spoke last week at a press conference about cybersecurity. How many of us are aware of how many Internet things we have in our home and how secure they are? Well, I mean, it's something I've personally remarked on. I was fixing something at home and looked at the list of connected devices to the router. Yeah. And it's enormous. Yes, exactly. You know, I've got vir virtually everything I use to work with or communicate with the outside world is connected to that router. Exactly. And the, the interesting thing was, I mean, you're, you're probably above the average, but actually the research shows already, you know, we've got every, the, average, the average home has eight connected devices. Wow. So you're beyond the average, of no, course. No, I'm, I'm way above that. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I think even my shoes are connected, I'm not sure. You know, most people, when their kids have friends round, the friends say, "What's your password to your router?" And you just and the, and the kids just give it to yeah. them. And and actually, everybody, there are some cyber security sort of cyber hygiene things that everybody should know. Which is, if you've got a router in your home, have your own password and have a guest password. Well, I, th I think that's been heightened at the time of recording this. We are two or three days into the Facebook data reveal thing with Cambridge yes. Analytica. Yeah. Um, and, and the striking thing about that that I don't think is being pushed enough is the fact that it wasn't so much the breach, it was the fact that when they collected the data, they collected the friends' data. Yeah. So it went from one million people filling in a quiz to 50 million profiles worth of data. Exactly. And, and that's uh, that casual sort of frictionless yeah. sharing and similarly, and, with, like you say, with Wi-Fi passwords, they take that password away. It's on someone else's device. Yeah, exactly. And the, the interesting thing here is that in design and creatives are setting up, you know, startups all over the place in this space, you know, developing mm. apps, pulling data here, there and everywhere without really much sense of, of this whole ecosystem that's expanding rapidly with lots of cracks in it. I think when we come back to this whole area of design and creativity, mm. we then we have to come to education. Absolutely. And education's really got to change. Whether you're on a graphic design course or a product design course, or you've got to look at the way design interacts. Well, I mean, I, this everything. week, this week I gave a lecture to students at the university, and uh, they were media students, and they're all very digital. You know, they, they don't use anything analogue. Yeah. They're all online. They've all got YouTube channels, all that sort of stuff. They were literally gobsmacked that there are machines out there that can edit trailers without any input from people. There are, there are <laughs> connected services that are distributing pieces of art that are selling better than the stuff humans produce. Yeah. And yeah. that they're going out into a world that I think in the back of their mind they view themselves being editors and publishers and this, that, and the other. And those roles are going because of Absolutely. the connectivity. Absolutely. Because the, Absolutely. what connectivity yeah. is giving them is aggregation and yeah. spread yeah. rather than fixed single yeah. artifacts. Yeah. So, so that comes back to what is the core thinking skills that yeah. can train people in design. Now, I'll, I'll throw something else at you I've been doing. I've been agitating recently online about art education in schools. 
Yeah. Oh, right. Subject yeah. dear to my heart, that. as a, My yes. first job was an art teacher. It just strikes me that when I sat down, I did a, an exercise. I've been taking things a bit easy recently, so I had a bit of time. So I did an exercise where I mapped skills that art teachers imparted to kids and skills that I use in my enterprise contracts, doing mm. architecture and mm. all of those big things. And when you actually match it, you find things like a lot of the core art skills if, are match you know agile processes for instance yeah. but you don't get any art teachers ever realizing that and using that language yeah and then unlocking it and do you think that's that's the level of change we need where we actually go in right to the bottom and start rethinking yeah we do actually need to understand those those core things that actually we learn when we're learning art and creative subjects they are different. If you go back to this right brain, left brain thing, whether you're doing a performance or you're learning to draw something or create something, it is a different, different sort of approach to thinking than, say, a mathematician. doesn't mean to say that a mathematician or a scientist isn't creative. Absolutely. Imaginative, but it's, they're using a different way and approach to it what we need more is enable the art and creative side to illustrate the power of that and and the value of it which the science and stem side have always been able to do yeah and i think as a result we've got this sort of emphasis on stem but in some ways to me the way stem is being interpreted is almost like craft skills teach people to program teach people to do this and actually, yes. those themselves aren't the skills we are going to need in the longer term. No. They might plug a medium term gap. But I, I've already installed an architect of machines that do the coding for you. Yes. So you yeah. kind of go, well, what value coding other than understanding the logic? Yeah, um, exactly. and, and I think that, that notion of craft skills is changing. And I think the notion of intellectual skills is now what I've said with art teachers recently is if if what you're doing is agile as a process, then start using the language of agile yeah. and stop going back in art teaching. Uh, sorry for banging on about art teaching. Yeah, I know, exactly. art teacher, but stop yeah. going back to the Marion Richardson archive and the Bauhaus way of doing things, which were forged in the era of mass production. Yeah. You yeah. know, and start, let's let, where are those new models coming from? I mean, I gather you're uh, looking at new ways of doing PhDs and things, which, you know, is a natural segue from that because actually we do need these new models. back to the word agile i think mm. actually our university education has got to change quite considerably partly because students are paying a lot of money for it partly because they can't afford to spend three years isolated in a sort of ivory tower and so by the time they get to a phd especially in the world of design and technology they need something that is much more agile, much more connected to industry, much more where they can build their skills. So we had a, a grant to do a project called the Creative Exchange. And for three years, the RCA, Newcastle University and Lancaster worked together. We had 21 PhD students. And rather than just the traditional PhD student comes in, they decide a subject they're interested in, they spend six months research reading about it, then they go out and collect some data or they they make something or they test something in a lab and then they write it up. This one, they immediately co-created with SMEs in the creative and digital sector ah. projects. They went out and basically did R&D in small SMEs around the digital public space, the notion of the digital public space, which came out of the BBC and Tony Aggie. But it was about how we can use archives, collectives, public health data, how we actually can use data and, and the material in the, public, uh, in, the, in the digital public space. But working with SMEs, to develop new products and services. So they they co-created with these companies and worked on projects, three to four projects over, over three years, and then wrote that up as a PhD. So, you know, they would look at, say, trust in the internet, or but they'd be at the same time doing actual projects. So in a so, way, you've, you've taken over bits of the, little bits of the notion of PhDs by practice. 
That's right. No, this is a sort of PhD through practice. Yeah. In industry, they were keeping up to date with what's happening in the in industry and the technology. And the other thing they were doing, because we had funds to give to the SME, so we had up to about twenty grand to give to the small business. If you're an SME and you're trying you're trying to grow, you're usually focused on your core business. You haven't got time to That's do R and D. Very much so. So you haven't got time to do any other R and D. So what we provided was a little bit of cash and a couple of PhD students who were. Either designers or artists or computing techie sort of orientation, we provided gave them those people and they worked together on projects. The whole notion was this is not the traditional PhD. This is actually working at speed. It was quite difficult because you have one idea of what a PhD is, which is a sort of more leisurely thought piece. They worked fairly rapidly because they were not in the university; they were in the companies. Now that's interesting because a few years ago I did some time at Microsoft at uh, mm. Xbox, mm. and one of my roles there was to go round universities that had things to do with games and the game studios mm. and mm. to find interesting things that people were doing and to try and link them into game studios. And I did that through a knowledge transfer partnership, which so, was another way of funding that. Mm. But but the point was exactly what you're talking about getting the research and the university together in a not in a situation that is symbiotic and equally benefits both rather than being focused on research or yeah. business. But it's not always the students that cause a slowdown. No, <laughs> absolutely. <laughs> often the university systems and the staffing and the way courses are structured. So I had to get the university to agree a collaboration agreement which had IP issues in oh, very right. quickly. They're not used to turning around contract in, in a week or a month. So if we come back to the, the word you used earlier, agile, yeah. agility and a fast-paced approach to things is, is, is needed in every realm of the universe at the moment. However, that does suggest that we come back to well-being and there's a lot of stress Absolutely. around too. So how do you balance that agility with the ability to reflect well-being. Talk to me then about well-being in companies and, and in, in this sort of sector, because you're designing, obviously, cities to increase people's well-being. But a lot mm. of what you're doing is feeding directly back, for instance, as you said earlier, into the small businesses who mm. get mm. contracts to make an app or they get contracts yeah. to do this, that and the other. How, how do they deal with the pressure? Uh, I'm not sure they are doing at the moment. I think, I mean, I'm a non-exec director of, of uh, something called Future Cities Catapult, which is a sort of not-for-profit making organization but the, there's a lot the new generation the young generation there is so much pressure on to work 24 hours you're always connected 24 hours you're always going to produce something at a rapid rate and i think it probably in cities is damaging people's work-life balance mm. i think it's damaging our sense of well-being but interestingly I've just finished writing a book called Living in Digital Worlds with a colleague of mine who's a biologist. We wrote a chapter on the digital for the evolved mind, and she talks about how the the, the brain particularly is plastic and has actually changed. Wow. With, you know, the, the plasticity of the brain means we adapt to new technologies. But I'm not sure we're fully adapted to the technologies that are around us yet. <laughs> Our brains don't evolve that quickly. So I think it is causing a lot of stress. And I think that's why a lot of people now are trying to connect to things through things like mindfulness. So coming back to making and creating people, more people are engaging with creative activities because, you know, writing poetry, making paintings, taking photographs or doing something that means you use your own abilities and your creative skills is partly why some people who are working in, say, the city, turn to those sorts of activities just for a change of pace. That was Richard F. Adams speaking to Rachel Cooper. If you're interested in finding out more about Rachel's work, you can read one of her books. She's got a book on designing sustainable cities and another one on the handbook of well-being and the environment. 
both topics were covered a bit in today's podcast. I think one of the best places to find out a bit more about her work is by looking her up on the Lancaster University website. So that's lancaster.ac.uk and you can find links to all of her publications and papers there. So thanks very much to Rachel for being part of today's interview. And in other news, we actually have some more technique events coming up. The next one's actually very specifically focused on how to sell artwork online. We're hosting the talk at Cockpit Arts, an amazing creative business incubator in London for craft businesses. And the event itself is listed on Eventbrite. Actually, the easiest way to find it is by going to our website, technique.create-hub.com. It's limited space, so it might sell out quite quickly. But there should also be a wait list on the site as well. So at the very least, sign up for that. Otherwise, that's all we've got time for this month. We will, of course, be back next month with a new episode. And in the meantime, why not follow us on Twitter? Our handle is at Technique UK. Otherwise, I'd just like to thank those that created the music for the show today. The last tune was by Immortal Beats. And thank you, as always, for listening. We hope these conversations are interesting, but if you have ideas of how we can improve the podcast, please get in touch either on the Twitter channel or contacting us through create-hub.com. Thanks again, and we'll speak to you again next month. Take care. Hello, this is Carla Rappaport. I'm the director and founder of the Lumen Prize. The Lumen Prize is the global award for digital art. It was called the world's preeminent digital art prize by the Guardian Culture blog, and it aims to raise the understanding, appreciation, and enjoyment of art created with technology globally. Anyone is eligible to enter the Lumen Prize. All you have to do is go to the Lumen Prize website, lumenprize.com, and all the information you need to upload your work and enter is there.